Um, so I'm Jem, I'm all the way from Southampton. Um, so Make It is our makerspace, our little baby. It's been running for about three years, two to three years now. Um, it came about as an idea back in 2009. Um, my husband and I both worked from home and we found all of our friends from university were all moving back to wherever they came from and we were left working from home with no friends. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're quite technical based people and my husband Benji had heard about making spaces, hacker spaces quite a lot and decided yeah we want to make one. Um, so the following week we then invited the internet into our flat um, to hack basically and I think we had quite a good afternoon of circuit bending and taking apart Furbies and lots of things. And it was good fun, and we decided, yeah, this is something we want to do. Um, so we started up, um, first of all, just an electronics hacking group. We, we met in cafes and bars and flats for a number of years. Um, and as we slowly got the interest, we decided it was time to get a space of our own. And we had the Makerspace people in mind. Um, so we sat up in the corner of someone else's warehouse for a while, um, back in 2003. Um, we started off with 2013. five... 2013. 2013. <laughs> <laughs> we started off with, um, you know, a small membership and five trustees who could sign on paperwork. And we grew and we grew, and now this winter just gone, we've moved into a thousand foot, square, uh, square foot warehouse. Um, and we like dust real estate all on our own. Um, so it's quite good. We're funded mostly by membership subscriptions. Um, we occasionally run big membership drives and um, Kickstarter campaigns to keep the money coming in. It's obviously not sustainable. We also have several sponsors. Jeremy's company is one. Um, and we're, we're getting there. We're, we're, we're doing good. We've got several groups that our members run, ranging from hardware hacking, electronics, through to sewing, knitting, baking, costuming. We have a quadcopter group. Um, lots of things. We now have seven trustees who can sign all the paperwork. They're the directors of our company, so we tried to incorporate as a charity. We were rejected. We don't have anyone with any knowledge to sort that out, so we had to become just a company limited. Um, we now have 100 members, all paying subscriptions. We have 35 key holders who can just come in and open space whenever they feel like it. We have another 100 or so supporters and friends and sponsors. Um, it's worked out quite well from this little idea five years ago. Um, we obviously have run into some trouble. I mean, the biggest one is the knowledge base. You know, we started off just as a pair and eventually five to seven people. We need someone who knows about legal stuff. We need someone who knows about money. Um, our original treasurer was the one who didn't say no. <laughs> he happened to be somewhere else in the room doing something else, and the other four treasurers went, yeah, you're the treasurer. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> and things like that, kind of logistics is still quite a problem. Um, finance is obviously always an issue. Um, safety and insurance, again, big things that you need to think about. If you're giving people access to big power tools and drills and stuff, then you need to be careful and make sure they know what they're doing. Um, gender inequality and diversity in general is an issue. You know, we started off from a hardware hacking group. Naturally, they were all mostly men, white men in their 20s to 30s. So we fought quite hard to bring in other people into that group. Um, I've been running a sewing group down there, which has worked out quite well. We've got quite a large number of female members. And then I got la asked last week, if women were allowed in our wood workshop. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we've still got some work to do, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, in total, though, it's been a real success. Um, we've, we try and run like big group projects, so we've built a life-size, bigger than life-size Dalek. Um, he's remote control, he can do his voice, he just runs around Southampton shooting people, which is good fun. Um, and that's brought together sort of 10 to 15 people with different skills, learning new things. I learned how to use circular saw, which was quite good fun. Um, we also run a men's shed, which is this movement out of Australia. So it's all around retired and unemployed men. 
So they meet in the daytime and I make a, in our maker space, which works out quite well for us because then they pay us to use the space when no one else is using it. Um, and it's basically great. We bring people together and we make awesome things together. Thank you. And Jen, Jen there showing her organisation skills spot on five minutes. Um, <laughs> as part of the live stream, if you tweet with the tag either hash OSHUG or hash BCS OSSG, uh, Andy Bennett here will pick up your tweet, so that's a way of getting questions through to the panel if you're not physically in the room. Our second speaker is uh, Laura James from Makespace Cambridge. Um, uh, Laura is one of the founders, and I've heard Laura talk before about some of the challenges of setting up and the legal and health and safety issues. So knowing her, she'd been heavily involved in that, I asked her to particularly um, cover that issue for us. And your five minutes to talk about whatever you would like to. Who wants to talk about health and safety? So, yeah, I am one of many. I'm one of three co-founders, one of 64 founder members who put cash up front to make Makespace Cambridge happen after quite a few years of building community and finding out what people wanted in the region. And now I'm one of 240 members. So uh, consider me just the representative who happens to be in the room. We are a community-run space, although we do have three directors who look after the non-profit organisation that provides very much a financial and legal framework for the community-run make space in the middle. We're a 24-7 make space. Members have 24-7 access to all of the space and equipment. It's about 350 square metres. And we have quite a lot of equipment. We've got electronics. Uh, 3D printing, laser cutting, CNC mill, glass work, fine scale metal work, so that's gold and silversmithing, vacuum forming, glass work, glass kiln, screen printing, computer control knitting, sewing, vinyl cutter, t shirt press, woodwork, quite a lot of metal work, lathe, terra metal, various other bits and pieces. Um, we have a classroom which is used for events, hackathons, workshops, talks, all kinds of things. Um, and of course, the ever present kitchen, which we call Cake Space has always been very important to us. Uh, we've been open just over two years now, and we've been stable at about 240 members for the last year, so that seems to be our sustainable level. Members will pay us £40 a month for their 24-7 access, um, and we use that, uh, that, uh, that to cover operating expenses, so month-to-month -month things. For big capital costs, we have, we have a seed funding grant from the East of England Development Agency that got us off the ground, and we also have industrial sponsors, so most of the big local engineering and IT firms have given us cash to help us buy laser cutters and things, which is much more expensive. Um, so oddly enough for us, finance actually isn't a problem, cash is not a problem. Uh, the main problem we have is that Cambridge does not have many physical spaces for in the city centre for such a workshop. So if we do lose our space at some point, if the block gets redeveloped, which it may at some point in the future, we will struggle to find another space. It's not a cash problem, it's that there is no other decent space. We have a workshop with a concrete floor, three space power, and natural light, and venting, and all kinds of stuff. It's perfect for us. Getting anything else, even remotely similar, is impossible. Um, so the, that's one threat to us. The other is, is volunteers. We are entirely volunteer run. Everyone who's ever been part of Make Space has been a volunteer. Um, and we're not doing too badly. Most of our volunteers, are, we have some churn in our membership. We have volunteers coming and going. Our most active volunteers, though, are probably a little bit overstretched, and it'd be great if we could get some of that off them. Um, I think to address the point about legal and health and safety, we try to separate our community run bit and the non-profit company bit. Um, so the non-profit company, I say, provides a framework. We make sure there's a bank account, there's a lease, there's insurance, there are risk assessments, and we've dealt with the various bits and pieces and stakeholders we have to deal with. And the community make decisions about things like, shall we get a second laser cutter? What 3D printer should we get? What kind of events do we want to learn? And so on. And that's been working pretty well for us so far. Um, you do need someone who can do money and who can figure out how to do health and safety and so on. Um, we're actually very lucky. Our space is full of very diverse people, um, all ages, a good range of ages anyway, over 18s only, but a good range of ages, gender diversity and racial diversity. We've got a good mix, it's wonderful. Um, but we also have quite a lot of people who are there for work. We have people who come to the make space as part of their job. Um, we have people who are setting up new businesses and so on. And I think that actually gives us access to quite a few people who are willing to do management type stuff as necessary, um, which has been good for us. And we've got great advice from local companies and from the universities locally. When we've needed advice about things like workshop safety, we've had their workshop managers come around and do inspections for us and so on. Um, 
you can do anything you want in our space, hobby work, make things for a business, start a business and so on. And in our two years we've had some great successes. We've had a couple of businesses start out of make space. Canny Box, which is an awesome um, 3D printed kind of make your own racing robots startup. They met at make space and got started and done all that prototyping there. Um, and we've had Simprints as well, which is developing identity technologies for the developing world. They built their entire prototype and their early production runs in make space and say that they would not be where they are today, which is financed and a team growing up to about eight people um, if it wasn't for make space. We've also had existing companies reduce their time to market by using make space prototyping facilities, in one case from 18 months to four months for their new product introduction times. So things like that help us get local support, which has been great. Um, I don't know if I've covered everything, but that's all I can think of to say at the moment. Um, it's been awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. <coughs> oh, I thought of one thing. We had, I was going to say, quickly, we had three aims when we set up. We wanted to raise the profile of engineering and manufacturing and show people that it's something that can happen outside China. We wanted to um, increase local skills, start local businesses, um, and we wanted to have a cool place to hack. We have done less outreach than we wanted. Although we've had lots of adults coming through, and we've definitely had people coming and learning new skills, we've done much less with kids and young people than we wanted, because that does take structured, managed time, and we haven't been able to pull that out with volunteers only. But other than that, all goes for it. Thank you. John T. Are you sure we're done? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John T. John T. Waring is one of the founders of uh, London Hackspace, and I asked him to come along because it is the biggest hack space in the country. In the world. In the world. In the world. I only looked at the UK statistic. So, <laughs> biggest hack space in the world. And he can give a perspective of what happens when you're really successful um, um, uh, uh, and what happens when you get really big. John T, over to you. Five minutes. Mostly things go wrong. That's <laughs> it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I am one of two co-founders of the Hack Space. Uh, I am one of eight current trustees. Um, we call them trustees rather than directors because directors makes people think that they should be making more decisions than they actually do. Um, as of earlier on today when I checked, we have 1,198 uh, 1, members, I think. Um, and they each pay a varying amount between five and about hundred pounds a month. It's pay what you want. Um, we don't link the amount you pay to anything inside the space. So someone who pays more does not get anything more than anyone else. They do it because they want to and nobody knows how much any of the member pays. Um, this funds everything for us quite comfortably now. Uh, we, in our current space, is our third space. I should say, sorry, we've been around since January 2009. Um, and our growth since we started has been fairly linear, but there's been a few bumps now and then. Um, but uh, our funding is entirely from the members. We have received a one grant of £5,000 when we first started. Uh, that was pure luck, to be completely honest. We didn't apply for it, they came to us. Um, and since then, all the members have funded all our outgoings, which has been great, uh, apart from we can only plan, so we can plan based on the membership growth, which is great. Um, but if we have to buy, buy something large, we won't go out for funding, we don't go looking for it. Um, we trust that our membership is a stable base that we should build on rather than trying to get money elsewhere. Uh, this is quite different than a lot of the other spaces. I think probably every space here has had some sponsorship uh, in equipment elsewhere, which is good. Um, frankly, we're just idiots for not going after it. Um, but uh, so our workshop now is about 12,000 square feet. That's about 6,000 square feet inside, but over two floors, and 6,000 square feet outside. And our workshop is very similar to what we've heard before. It's uh, we have a mix of facilities, like woodwork, metal work. Uh, soft work, desk work, a uh, classroom. Uh, I think the only thing that we have that no one else has is a fairly large robotics area. Um, and well, and actually outdoor space, that's fairly uncommon as well. Mm -hmm. But we also have a similar problem in that our space is amazing where it is now, but London is being gentrified at such a frightening rate. When our lease expires in three and a half years' time, we are not going to be able to stay there. Um, the chances of us affording the rent are just not, not going to happen. Our current outgoings are, I think, around, you might know this better than I do, Martin, it's about £10,000 a month? Yes. About £10,000 a month outgoings. So it's incredibly expensive for, for us to operate at all. Um, the main issues we've had with the space as it's grown uh, is that the things that people have taken to be the golden rules of hack space has just stopped working. Um, 
But one by one, they fail. The only one I think we're still doing to this day is meeting on a Tuesday night because all the other nights are terrible, um, <laughs> which is a good idea. Um, but all the other ones, uh, your community gets so large that it naturally splits into smaller groups. And that just doesn't work for us. We've been saying for years that we wanted more than one space in London. In fact, we said, actually, I remember having the conversation before we'd even started the space that there should be more than one space in London. Which is why when Tom finally got the South London space off the ground, we were quite happy. And there's been since then a whole plethora of other spaces that have appeared uh, looking after different things. And that's, that's brilliant. And we want more of that. Uh, I do not think that it is a good idea to have one really massive space. It is better to have smaller ones. But at the same time, it's important to maintain the cross-discipline nature of what we have. Otherwise, you lose all the interesting things. Um, and that's what I worry about when we end up with a really specialist space in London. Um, I had something very important to say, which I completely forgot. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, we'll have plenty of chance to say later. So I will. Um, yeah, so the, the other thing that is worth mentioning is uh, many years ago we also set up the Hackspace Foundation, which has been at some time very active and sometimes completely dormant. Uh, and it is a loose sort of organisation of people from all over the UK that help try and set up other spaces and provide advice. We have friendly lawyers, uh, we have good contacts with industry in certain places, uh, and recently it's been used a lot for people coming to us who want to give out licenses for software or sponsorship or things like that, and because we have contacts in all the spaces, it's easier for us to go and talk to all the spaces than someone else. Um, a lot of this will be kicking off in the next two months, so all the spaces will be getting some nice, free, shiny things, we hope. Um, and then also, off the back of the hack space, we also run a large uh, Hacker Maker camping festival now. Uh, which runs every two years and is about 1,500 people. Um, and that's sort of to bring together all the different spaces. It's not, expli not explicitly a hackspace thing, um, but we feel it's important to have meetings between all the spaces. They can become quite insular and, and people don't talk to each other as much as they should. Uh, I'm not even sure that's the right way to approach it, but that's what we're trying for now. Um, yeah, that'll do for me. Thank you very much. Our next speaker um, is Tony Fish, um, and Tony is the co-founder of Fab Lab London. I particularly wanted Fab Lab London involved um, because of its Fab Labs tend to have a more commercial focus. And I went and looked up, um, you know, who to contact at Fab Lab London, and discovered it was founded by someone called Co Tony Fish, who I've known for about 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good excuse for me and Tony to meet up again. Um, Tony, you yes. have five minutes. I have five minutes. You'll have to shut me up in five minutes. I'm bound okay. to go over. Right. So, so, are these in the out? Yeah, cool. Just making sure. <laughs> Um, Fab Lab London. Fab Lab, it is slightly different, um, and everything you've heard about the labs, absolutely love. I just want to go back 15 years or so and what happened in software. Um, software changed subtly because software started to write software, and the person, the human, wasn't needed. And the reason then kids could start writing apps on iPhones and earn millions of dollars is not because they were gifted coders, because actually software was writing software. And fairly much, software is better now than most humans at writing software. Fantastic. Hardware got completely left behind. Um, give or take a bit, we know from most of the spaces already, they cost shed loads of money to put together. What happened five years ago is the laser cutter came from a million down to 50 grand and now is 10. Uh, the 3D printer came from stupid money down to 50 grand, now two, in fact 500 quid. And the CNC milling machines came from a million dollars down to now two grand. Um, what you're now starting to see is machines make machines. And that's what we're going for, is not so much come here, hack, which is absolutely endorsed, fantastic skills, and I love it, and we support absolutely everything, and we have loads of people coming in. What we're really desperately interested in is getting our machines to make other machines. And in the summer, we've got a pile of interns and people coming in, and they have a remit, which is, you've got to make a machine for yourself, and you've got to make a machine we can give away. Now, the lossiness of the system is massive at the moment. A um, bit like software was when it started to write itself, it was sort of 30% pretty good and 70% absolutely rubbish. And it's now probably the software is as good as, it, you know, it kind of like replicates itself pretty well. Machines at the moment, it's about a 70% loss. You go from something quite big to something quite small. Uh, it's a bit fiddly, the software is not great. We're expecting in the next 18 months that loss would be 50%. And probably in uh, 36 months, maybe 48 months, it's going to be 80% uh, pretty good, 20% loss. And five years' time, it's probably going to be the machine producing a machine is going to be as good as. 
So we've got a, a, a different type of philosophy. We absolutely agree with the skills. We've managed to get the kids piece, love to share with it. It's hell on earth. Uh, we'd, we'd get teachers, we had 60 teachers in the lab this evening who were coming in to learn not how to code, it's how to use the laser cutter, how to use the 3D so they can go back, not knowing how to use the machine, but with an application. How do they take it to a history lesson? How do they take it to a geography lesson? How do they teach maths as part of it? And that's what gets them really excited. They don't really give a monkeys about computer science and hardware. What they care about is the kids and the future of those kids and know they've got to have digital skills which can affect them. And they need the application, not just a piece of coding. Um, so we're having lots of fun. Um, really encourage anybody to come out of the play because it's, um, it's great. Love everything these guys are doing. And this, I don't know if you know, do, you, do they know who you are? Do introduce. <laughs> do you not know Liz? She's like the most important person in London. She organises like the 30 labs across London and brings them all together and takes them around once a month so we go and visit them all. It's massively important girl. She is like, she is the, the goddess of London's labs. So, happy days. Yeah, bow down. <laughs> She's on the front row as well, so it's easy to point out. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'm sure questions will come for you as well. It's just because you're that side doesn't mean you won't get asked questions. <laughs> Our next speaker, panellist, uh, Tom Lynch, as we've heard, founded South London Hat Space and also involved in Make the... Makespace. Yeah. Make yeah. Space. <laughs> oh, that's that's all too close, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> it's because I've written over it. You're also involved in the open workshop. Well, Which is this is thing. And I've carefully wrote, written over the word and done it. South London <laughs> Makerspace, okay? And the reason I wanted Tom here is particularly to be what's it like being not the biggest hack space or makerspace in London? <laughs> You've got your five minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer that question right here um, and this exact moment. But um, I wanted to just talk about where um, South London Makerspace kind of came from. Um, it's kind of got a really weird long history. It's actually, unfortunately, its history is almost as long as Hackspace has been open, um, which is kind of interesting. So it kind of started around uh, September 2011 uh, with um, a, it's not quite clear exactly how it started because no one that was originally involved in it uh, is still there. But it's interesting because um, uh, it started off with, for me, going to a meeting in a pub where people were just kind of talking about, you know, we want to have a, a hack space. And I think initially it started its name as Brixton Hack Space. And it has, interestingly, it was connected to Blaine Cook, for one of the CTOs, ex CTO of Twitter, um, and people like Brock Craft and Alex Deschamps and Cena. So there's quite a few interesting people involved in where we've come from. But unfortunately, it's not actually that easy setting up these spaces. And it requires a lot of commitment. And all these people have, you know, their other big commitments is why we, I guess we know those names. Um, but what's interesting is that around that time there was a, an exhibition called The Power of Making at um, the Victorian Albert Museum, um, which was, by Daniel, uh, was curated by Daniel Charney. And him and Fidian Warman from the Makers Guild uh, kind of held this meeting. It was, um, just sorry, I'm just looking through our website. Uh, <laughs> all of this off the top of my head, sorry. Um, I think it was around Christmas 2012. Dates might be wrong, I'm not sure. Um, but there was a proposal to have some kind of tinker space, is what it was called. And that name came from the V&A exhibition, where there was a space within that actual exhibition called uh, the Tinker Space. Um, and they wanted to kind of have, you know, kind of uh, uh, like a hack space, but for South London, because you know, the distance travelled. And also, you know, as you kind of pointed out, John, the size that it's growing is just kind of unsustainable. Um, and also, to, I guess, it gives you a chance to try things in different ways as well to learn from issues that have happened. Um, so it kind of, um, kind of just went from there and people started meeting and, and as these things do, they sort of fall apart and stop happening for a bit and then they come back together. And so <laughs> unfortunately, um, it took a little while before um, one of the other co-founders of um, the Makerspace, Tom Newsom, um, it gets really confusing having so many Toms in Makerspace, but um, um, we also have a collection of Matthews and uh, other people, so it's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, so myself and Tom Newsom are kind of the main two people. We also have a lady called Yulia. Um, Tom really is kind of one of those people that really just goes for things and sort of screw the consequences. And I'm one of the kind of really conservative, like we should really hold back and consider this and have you thought about the consequences? But apparently I became a director without really knowing about it. <laughs> um, and when I got a letter uh, through the post saying congratulations uh, from company's house. Um, and then we kind of went from there. Um, 
I did have some foresight that was going to happen. Um, so it's just kind of going from there. Then around this time last year, uh, the 1st of April, we moved into uh, a temporary kind of pop-up maker space type uh, space, uh, which was in a shop front, a disused shop front in Hearn Hill, which is quite close to where the original pub meeting uh, was in Brixton. Um, and uh, we stayed there for four months, just paid the council uh, business rates and nothing else, um, and electric, I suppose. Um, and it was just really popular. We went from zero to about 65 members, paying 20 pounds or more a month uh, in that period. Um, but then when that ended, we needed to find another space. And we didn't find one before we had to move out. Um, uh, eventually, we found one in October last year, um, which is a railway arch literally five meters behind where the shop front was, uh, which is uh, convenient. Um, and we've uh, been renovating that space since. So we're kind of a bit short on cash, and it's a really old Victorian railway arch that has nothing in it. So we've been doing quite a lot of work and, um, and begging and borrowing from uh, companies. And, uh, thankfully, the, um, I'm supposed to mention this, uh, the Greater London Authority, which you better know as the Mayor of London's office, has kind of uh, donated um, or sponsored us, or whatever you want to call it, uh, for further renovation work to complete the second half of it. So that's um, uh, been really fantastic. That happened last month. So that's kind of my little history of Makerspace. And if anyone wants to talk about that, we can do. But definitely wanted to just mention the Open Workshop London thing again. Uh, like, it's been really useful for us to talk to people. Um, and I think it will be interesting to tie that in with the Hackspace Foundation in the future. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, what I'm going to do is, then, if you like to just say a couple of words about <laughs> yourself and well, Open Workshop, because this has come up twice, and that would help people. And that would take, <laughs> take, take, take a seat <laughs> temporarily. The most I'm important share of the <laughs> My name is Liz Corbin. I am just the organiser of a group called Open Workshop London. So I'm very much kind of the facilitator on the ground. Um, it spurred out of a P my PhD, which is around open access workshops and open source hardware and design, um, which is called Open Workshop Network. So the idea is that eventually um, what we're having in London will be able to go sort of nationwide um, looking at each different region and trying to find and support the various hack spaces, fab labs, make spaces and general open workshop um, that are within those areas. So London is going quite well. We have 41 spaces now. <laughs> One just opened. So we have um, 41 spaces that are meeting every month. We tour around to a new workshop every month, and it's basically we just, it's a physical way that we can all get together and speak about common issues and also ways to support one another. Happy days. Brilliant. Happy days. Oh, thank you very much, Liz. Thanks for coming. <laughs> our, our last uh, official panelist uh, uh, was going to be Nikos Pronios. And I knew Nikos was going to be very tight on making it here. Um, he had then found a substitute, which is Jonathan Michener, and it looks like Jonathan hasn't made it here yet. <laughs> but knowing these things might happen, I had a third substitute lined up. <laughs> so Nigel, would you come and join us at the front? <laughs> Nigel Ricks is from the Knowledge Transfer Network, which is charged with basically ensuring knowledge transfer smoothly between universities, government, and industry. And forms part of Innovate UK. How many people here know what Innovate UK is? One or, one or two. It's the government's innovation agency. It, it has a budget of over half, half a billion. Half a billion next year. Yeah, half a billion next year, which is used to support um, the transition of ideas from academic concept into uh, uh, industry stuff. And I declare an interest because uh, my company's had several projects funded by them. Nigel, um, the reason for asking Innovate UK to be involved was we are very conscious that when we have meetings we get a lot of makerspace and hackspace people coming along and it's surprising how many of our speakers turn out to have then had Innovate UK funding. So the question is what role does the state have to play in the makerspace hackspace movement and that's if you've got five minutes to talk about what you'd like to talk about but that's why I'd asked Innovate yeah. UK to take part. So I'm third substitute. I didn't know I was about to say anything for five minutes. Um, 
Innovate UK have got a wonderful period. Innovate UK is part of the government. So they were called the Technology Strategy Board. They themselves are impaired of that because of the elections, so they can't say anything interesting about money, um, but they can answer questions. The Knowledge Transfer Network has changed as of last year. There used to be 15 Knowledge Transfer Networks that are very much based on various industry sectors or economic challenges. So there's Knowledge Transfer about built environment, one around energy, there's one about materials, I particularly work in what's called the applied technologies, which are electronics, photonics, space for some reason is in our area, but the technologies are used in other places, they're in enabling technologies. In other areas. The challenge I've always had with makerspaces, and it's, a, it's a, a nice challenge because I've not solved it, but I believe there's something in there somewhere that we do. Innovate UK is charged with being responsible for innovation within the UK. Innovation is a driver for economic growth. It, it is seen as important for industry, for economy, that innovation is great. The UK has a wonderful position that it's fantastic at invention. It is lousy at any, making any money out of it. And I've got a slide which I have, which is something like 30 great inventions everyone will recognize, where the UK invented it and then made no money because someone else picked it up. So one of the challenges we've got is, is innovation itself, the UK is great at it. How do we convert that into economic benefit? The Knowledge Transfer Network now is about 170 people strong. So it's moved from being national, from organisations focused on native industry now, to a complete cross sector and across the whole of the UK organisation. Trying to help industry, and I have to say we, we look at businesses. Education is not within our scope of work, I'm afraid. Um, but we try and help businesses look at ways in which they can innovate and generate economic growth. It, I'm afraid it is state aid, it's money being spent by the government. The nice thing is they don't take any IP based on what it is, it's just very clean money, you get a grant to offset the risk of a project. Um, and the idea is it will make companies more profitable and grow. So our job is to provide the connections between industry and Innovate UK itself. We also, by trying to understand what is happening both from the technology side but also from the challenge area, be able to advise Innovate UK on what projects, what funding areas there should be. How could IoT be moved forward in the UK or, or what other things there? My challenge has always been that makerspaces are fascinating. They remind me, so I'm not one of the 20 to 30 or whatever the demographic was earlier, I'm one of the 60 to 70 year old old farts who remembers the radio club when I was at school. And the whole, and I built my first PC, having imported the board from the States and sold them all together. It was Motorola 6009, and it was great fun. And Raspberry Pi, in some way, is a great <coughs> throwback to those early days where you didn't get it all in a box, it all worked. You had to do some work before you could get it. But how do we work alongside, how do we help make spaces? Throw money at make spaces. A, we have not got any money ourselves. But, but what is the thing that we could do that is of interest? It's not money. We've worked with Andrew and we've funded teas and coffees for various things so that they have just offset the cost of running a, a weekend type stuff. We've worked with some of the Liverpool groups where they have had. Um, Hack weekends that were focused at trying to bring together, say, the medical community with the hackers to look at how they could work together and drive a product. And that has gone to the point now where they take those into involving VCs, and after a bit, the top product gets either support from the space or gets introduced to VCs and moves forward. And that's fantastic because that brings a challenge that's not part of the makerspace movement with the makerspace experts and a route where it could go forward for um, greater deployment and benefit. There are schemes for feasibility studies. One of the things about Innovate UK is it tries to look at areas of funding which are too risky for either a venture capitalist or for a bank. And so it's trying to fill in the bits. Most of them are for physical real companies, I'm afraid, rather than individuals, because it has to, to, to have things that can actually make money. But there are feasibility studies which they give money for where it really is you've got a, a bright idea, 
you have got all the money for, for, for doing it, but they will fund, take some of the costs, and for SMEs that can be 60% of the funding costs of just taking and seeing where the money is for. So I'm here to learn, but it is, how can we help? Do we just stay out of the way, don't do anything? We've got enough to do elsewhere. But the, the, the thing I have is the maker spaces, and probably the companies that people represent in the maker spaces, so the people, you're in maker spaces, you're innovative people, and therefore we can help your company make sure they do more innovation themselves. That may be one of the areas. We're really friendly and always keen to help. Yep, yeah, you are. Totally yeah, I can confirm. <laughs> we're all three. I can confirm all three of those. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you for the five-minute introductions. Now we move to discussion. If you're, again, if you're listening online, tweet your questions. I've got a number of topics that I think we want to cover tonight. But before we go that, I'll just say any first initial questions or comments out of the audience. Mark, yeah, just just on the um, just on the um, aspects of um, greater innovation, but we're not going to keep a hold of it. Basically, um, I was watching a program a few weeks ago about um, how easy it is for our, our listing companies to be taken over. Um, and I'm just, I'm sure you know where I'm going to come from. But basically, in America, for example, if you issue like a rights issue. It doesn't mean that you've given away control, and indeed, um, American companies can, can, can maintain only about five, only about five percent of the shares, but they still maintain control. Whereas in this country, what I'm looking at is once you get beyond a certain size and you want to go that route to raise money, you've got problems, haven't you? And I, and I, I, I just wonder, what would you do? is that is that an issue that you've got? A rights issue is it's where you've overfunded. Basically, you're doing a down round within the equity. I'm a, I'm a venture capitalist. I have been for 15 years. I invested 68 million last year. So, I, yeah, it's capital structure stuff. Um, somebody, if somebody has 5% equity in his own company, that's because they've given a preference share and it's made a big difference. No, no but in, in, in this country, there are different rules about share ownership as to what they are in the state. Yeah, no, I think I'm going to... I'm going to cut it's, so, it's so off topic. I, yes, I'm, I'm going to cut in here. I think there's a great conversation for Tony and Mark to have in the pub <laughs> afterwards, but we've it's got a lot to cover, and I think we're, 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 we're at outside direction. I'll take two more questions, and we'll go for, for the audience. Um, you mentioned that you broke the rules of, the five rules of golden rules or whatever. All right, so... Uh, what, what, what are the five rules? <laughs> Sorry. I will have to refer to a wiki on a website somewhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, there's, there is um, a sort of established set of what's known as the Hackspace design patterns, which have been uh, built on over the years. So just for anyone who doesn't know, Hackspace has been around a long time. Uh, they originated in Germany until the late 80s and then they've been growing ever since. They didn't make it outside Germany until the early 2000s, they went to the America and they came here much later. Um, it's been a long, a long growth, but over that time people have documented things they've learned, things that you should do. And some of those things hold true when you're small, but as you grow bigger they start to break down. Um, and figuring out how to continue those things is an ongoing thing. Uh, at this point I would say that the London hack space is as much a social experiment as in anything else. Um, so it's, it's, it's very hard to figure this stuff out. Um, but we figure that us figuring it out means that people can learn from our experience and hopefully document it better. Uh, if you'd like, I can catch a bit about it in the part afterwards. <laughs> to answer the question, so, if you Google hack space design patterns, you'll mm -hmm. find those. Yeah. Cornelia. Uh, some of you mentioned the links that you have with universities. and. Uh, I've worked in education all my career, and in a sense, working in an engineering department, you have your own kind of hack space, but it isn't public. Do you think there is more scope for uh, collaboration between hack space and their local university? Because, after all, the universities are, uh, you know, uh, resources for everyone in the community. There, there is a direct relationship between the local hack space and the universities now. Um, at least in some cases, not all of them, but everyone wants to do it. And a lot of the cases now is the university has gone, this is a great idea, we want that too. And they've opened up to all the other students. So UCL, uh, Kings, who else? Uh, there's, there's at least four or five in London alone. Uh, and they have essentially gone and taken, you, you'll have the full list anyway. Um, they've, a lot of the members of the hack spaces have split up. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah but, <laughs> uh, but it's more that the members. UK are, universities yeah. are outside of London as well. Well, no, no, yeah. I was, yeah. I was yeah. saying that you know, there, is, there are some elsewhere in the yeah. country yeah. as well. Gem, can I just ask you from Southampton? Yeah, um, 
Southampton has been interesting because we have the two universities, one very um, science and technology based, one very media based. And our um, science based university, I think several times now, has approached us and said, what you're doing is fantastic. Can we have one of what you've got, please? Uh -huh. And we've said, well, your, your students are welcome to come down. You're welcome to come and have a look. Please give us some money. That would be great. Um, but they kind of, we talk back and forth. And then what, what usually transpires is that they want something like we have, but purely for their staff and students, which then obviously we're not interested in. So it's been... I went, then, to then, a, I went to, sorry, to Bay, and yeah, I, went, yeah. I went to a lot of meetings with um, Southampton University to talk about them supporting us as a maker space, um, I think possibly before we even got started and also after then. Um, and there was a lot of discussions with lots of people around the table and nothing really came of it. Um, what the general conclusion I got after I think six or seven meetings was they wanted to make their own one in the Students' Union building so that potentially people from the public could go to it but as kind of second class citizens. Um, and that they wanted it to be extremely well funded with like millions of pounds worth of equipment and dedicated people there all the time to make sure that the machines were used properly and various all sorts of bureaucracy and stuff. Oh, they wanted staff. We yeah. don't have staff, we remember right. Yeah, they volunteering. <laughs> so it was a very different thing that they were proposing mm -hmm. and we've not had any luck in trying to get them to support us. So one of the things that may come out of this evening is the ability of shared experience of how you approach universities, because one way to beat up universities is here's another university that's done it better. Mm -hmm. Ni Nigel, you're... So, sorry, there's, there's eight, uh, eight, eight fab labs in the UK, of which five of them are already university-based. There will be 20 fab labs by the end of the year. The next 12 coming online are all university-based. Okay, so fab labs... Can I also add to that? Yeah. So I work at um, a space called the Institute of Making, which is at UCL. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an open access workshop for UCL staff and students. So you're completely right. I think academia, very conventional, the way that they think is if there's a core funded space, then it should be able to go first and foremost to the students and staff. I think there's new models coming up where they will kind of um, akin to an open access day that Fab Lab has on a Saturday. So there'll be a model where some days are for university members and then another half of the week is for open access public membership. And in terms of outside of London, so there's Imperial, advanced Imperial hack space and um, Institute of Making here in London, but also uh, Sheffield, uh, Cranfield's trying to open one, Open University is exploring the idea, so there's, it's Dundee's exploring the idea. Mm -hmm. it's I think there, there's a lot of interest in academia, but they want it for themselves. There's, uh, there's one thing to say, that, like UCL does have open days, as you well know, but it's like, they do have public open days, but it's, it's a bit weird, because you can go along and say, it's like, this is great, you can't come here. <laughs> so, so, which which is a shame. I know early on in the discussions it was like there will be hopefully. Well, they flip flap. Like, depending on who who hurts themselves depends if they lock down or they open up. And, and as they forget that somebody hurt themselves, they open up again. Then somebody gets hurt and they shut down. It's a, Laura, it's you you you've got very strong relations with the university. Uh, we're totally independent of them. <laughs> you are yeah. totally independent, yeah. but you have a we're good very, constructive we have relationship. We have a good relationship with them. Yeah. They've been very helpful in a certain number of ways. I think, however, there is a fundamental conflict of interest. The university has its own goals. And one of the things they want from us is they want our amazing interdisciplinary network. That's the value they see in us. It's not the kit, it's not the space, it's the people. But they are not willing to create a space in the university that they would actually open up on the kind of terms that we're open, 24 7 for members with open events as well. And they have no way to do that within the structure um, of the thing. One of the reasons that we're an independent organisation is because Cambridge has more than one university. And we want to be open to everybody, town, gown, both universities, people from outside the region, everything. So we have to be independent for that reason. Okay. There's a question Not, down there. Yeah, I, I've, um, I'll come to you in a moment. Eh? N Nigel, is this something, you, you, your whole job is networking universities and other organisations. Mm -hmm. Is this something where KTMs could, if, yes, I, if someone came to us and said, look, we'd like some help, we want to try and draw these links across, we, we have got national coverage and we've got even one person in Northern Ireland, but let us know we're interested in how to do that. I think there is a thing that is 
philosophically, a makerspace or hack space is about the individuals doing something because they enjoy it, and profit is not the biggest motivation directly. I did hear Daresby was setting up a, what they called a maker lab, but it was almost like a prototyping workshop for the local companies. And what they were trying to do is, if we get this kit together, it provides something that's a useful resource for local companies to come in and use, and we'll call it a makerspace. I, I don't know how far that's got. I know they've got a letter inside a big building or, or, or a lab for it. But it, it, it wasn't the same thing as people fundamentally helping each other. And I have one working example of this actually being like the university working well, which Martin just shouted at me from the back of the room, um, uh, is that our biohacking group has really good ties with, uh, which university is that? I can't actually remember. <laughs> <laughs> is it, it's not UCL, I always think it's UCL, it's not. Is it UAS? Yes. King, maybe Kings, can't remember. Um, but they actually fund, they have funded, funded our groups to go out to the US. Uh, they go to these what labs, they come to our lab and work together. Uh, they like enter competitions together. There is a lot of strong ties there. And that's something that I could see happening more often. But they're not putting money into the space directly, it's into the members, which is interesting. Yeah, I think that's more because of the members. The, the group actually has some yeah. people who actually have influence over it. Well, actually, they approach us independently. Of that I David, of course you've got a question, but I want to move on because it's <laughs> time to go. Oh, no, no, you, I'll bring, come back to you in a minute. Okay. I want to move on and address one particular issue because talking before the meeting, it's a common theme that comes up, which is the challenge of actually maintaining a community, particularly when you're a member run. Um, Jen, would you kick us off on that? Because I know that's something that's been dear to your heart and a big challenge down in Southampton. Yeah, um, that was me speaking first. Okay. Um, Yes, so we, sort of the, the initial group of people I think that we had together, um, we were all very much enthusiasts about making, um, so, you know, making, um, but we didn't have much knowledge in how to run groups. Um, I mean, a couple of us were scout leaders and things, but nothing big, I guess. Um, so our, our issue all along has been how to get volunteers, first of all, in to run parts of the makerspace, and then to get you know get people to volunteer. Basically, I mean, we we always want to do some sort of outreach and get into the community, spread the word that we're here, this is what we're doing, um, and we have a membership of a hundred ish <coughs> members, and we have found that on the whole, it's the same six to ten people always doing the same events and um, because of the DAR that we built, for example, we keep getting invited to these conventions and it's always the same, five people going to these events and these conventions have like a season, so from, I don't know, October through to April, every couple of weekends it's been the same five people doing the same thing in a different hall, um, which has been quite hard work. Um, and we want to do it, we want to get out there and do these things, but it would be nice if we could encourage more people to take on some of that responsibility. I don't know if you want to write anything. Tom, <laughs> can I bring you in here? Yeah. Because one of the things that struck me when you talked was the fact that none of your original founders are, are still in uh, South London Makerspace, which is a bit different from the other. And that strikes me that you may have got some experience of building and maintaining and keeping a community that's worth understanding of why have you had that turnover in Chile? Um, well, so I think it's just because it was such a long period of time, as I said before, kind of because people had such a such a focus on other things in their lives, mainly work commitments and things like that, whereas I suppose some of us less uh, more gullible people just <laughs> have ended up being roped into uh, looking after. I think like the trust we have, currently five, we call them trustees as well, five directors of the company at the moment. Um, uh, I think we're going to go back to three. But we're, not, we're not firing anyone, they're just people moving away. Um, but um, I think um, it's interesting that it does always seem to default back to us. So I don't think that we've got it right. I just think it's just the way it happens. Like, but we have become a bit more wise to things. So, for example, public events. Like, like we signed that. We were the only uh, place in all of the south of England that signed up for the recent Arduino Day. And... We signed up for it coincidentally on the same day as another event that we had. So, like, we 
had all committed, the trustees had committed to go to one event and the members had to kind of pull together and it worked out really well. But you know, it's kind of it is difficult. And I definitely agree with that kind of ten percent rule where about ten percent of people kind of really commit and, and help out as the rest are kind of I wouldn't like like begrudge them of it. It's just, you know, like they're just they they're using the space rather than necessarily putting in a great amount to it. Um, I think I think that's just the way it is. People didn't sign up, I suppose, for like volunteering and it's, if they want to make it better, they can take it the ball by the horns if you like and make it better. If they don't then it kind of stays the way it is though. So as uh, a local uh, Lambeth country fair is an event that we've got coming up locally to us uh, soon and we've decided if no one else is going to organise it then we're just going to not do it because it's a lot of work and we're still building our space right now so you know, we're still kind of organising all that and having all the kind of deadlines for that to kind of go through at the same time. So I think one of the challenges described as the number of people who come up and say you really ought to do this and yeah. turning it around and saying no you do it yeah. we're here to enable it. John T, I mean you've been through, you know, the, the, you, you talked about the whole problem of maintaining community breaking down when you get to your size. I mean, have you got anything that you, you know, that you could pass on to others coming up through that route? There's the the opposite of what you described, where you say, um, we, we've always called it well volunteered, which is okay. Someone comes along and goes, I think you should do X, and like, well volunteered, off you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And that works really well when you're very small. But what turns out of that, you have a weird st uh, social change that comes with that which is that people then won't suggest anything that they can't do. And they might have a great idea, but they're too scared to say anything. Um, so we've banned that phrase now. We just, like, we just stopped doing it because it became so harmful in certain situations it was not worth doing. But at the same time, you do have an issue with, with getting uh, people to do stuff. There's something that um, I, I learned a couple of years ago, which is talking to a lot of people from spaces all around the world. And I, I know it doesn't entirely hold true all over the UK, but once you go over about 100 members, uh, you start seeing about 30% of your members are active in the space any, in any given month. And that doesn't mean active in terms of maintaining the space, it means active as in coming to the space. Um, and then of that you're going to get a subset, which is about 10%, which is what you've seen already, which will actually do anything. And it seems to just hold true, it's just, it, it's just the size of the groups that have roughly set things. Well, um, yeah, yeah so, so, so there's a kind of an interesting empirical rule with collaborative groups which says that 1% are creators, like yeah. have genesis of activities and ideas, 9% um, are curators and the rest of the 90% are consumers of mm. these things. So what extent do you find that 9% is useful and how do you get them to kind of engage the wider community? It's difficult to judge how much that would actually line up with our numbers without running the so stats on it. Also, how, how roughly does that line up with, uh, with different people in different sizes? I don't know with, with other people. Is, I'm oh, curious to see. 10% highly active volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, there's one thing also with that. that, that um, 30% number is from spaces where they have enough people that people will keep paying even if they don't use the space very often. If you have a high entry bar to entry, that will not be true for you at all. Um, like you're, you're like 40 pounds or something. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it, the people will stop paying that, whereas people for us will just drop it down to five and that will be okay with that. So. Nigel. I, I suppose one of the things that when we start any activity, we start a new group because it's something you've been through, you can often, it either turns into a lemon, in which case it dies and we kill it off and we start again on something else. Or you can get up to 100 people signing up on websites and start to get active. Once you get above a certain bit, it's best to start to fragment it down. We we're members of Cambridge Wireless, which is a loose association of people. One of the things they did, they started very much as around mobile telecoms, whereas now they've actually fragmented it down into lots of different groups looking at specific areas. I'm slightly curious whether the maker spaces do, as they get bigger, do you form subgroups which say, look at different things? In terms of, someone's gonna kill me. In terms of help, I suppose the KTN now runs about an event every day. By that, it means that we've got the back office capability of putting it up on event, right, collecting things. We can even supply the badges and if you really trust our arms, someone to hand them out, or so sort of that. The connections to industry, if you want those, either directly within the electronic sector, but particularly from external to that, we are very interested to see what we can do to help. The thing that I would love to be able to try and tap into is things like, 3D printing is a great hype. Half of industry believes that with a 3D printer, you can not only make your, your chocolate cake, but you can also print your ear, and it will make anything you you could possibly think of. 
And within industry, there is a great misunderstanding almost of what you actually can and what you can't do. And that's a big challenge because we get people saying, oh, we've got this new product, we'd love to 3D print the case. And you, you, you look at it and say, well, mm, maybe you can't find someone who can help you just say what is practical, what isn't practical. If it was sort of trying to tap into that knowledge, and how do you connect companies locally with it or get to it? Yeah, a Makerspace Open Day for local industry would be fantastic. We'd really support that very, very actively. So, so just on that, Barclays uh, just given us uh, a stack load of cash. We're taking through every single Barclays um, yeah. branch manager in London at first, through the Fab Lab to train them on a 3D printer, on a laser cutter. So when they go to their businesses and the business is saying, we want to buy one of these things, they actually start to understand it. We've just taken through all the partners of Bird and Bird, doing exactly the same. We've got two other law firms, we're doing exactly the same. Um, it's a really, we've got a completely different model. We don't charge members, not interested. It's, a, it's just a madness of trying to do tiny little things for us. Um, we want to try and disseminate the information and get people, as many people through the lab, playing with the machines. Um, we're not going for trying to, uh, anybody trying to make products. Um, you just haven't got enough time. You, you kind of like need your own machines. It's trying to introduce people into those machines and get them to understand the implications and actually see where it's going to go and suddenly start to understand that all Formula One engines are 3D printed. I, if you come to our lab, I'll print you a chocolate. No problem at all. I'll then print you a conductive T-shirt. Okay, we'll show you it working. We did the cranium uh, for one of the skulls at the Harley Street guys. Uh, we ain't bother what people come in and use the machines for. Um, one of the guys printed it yesterday, they're doing a Formula One engine, so we're actually, this evening, it's a 65 hour print that's started, uh, which is which is started off, so they're going to be in on Monday to pick it up and take it off to a show. Happy days, because it starts to show what's possible. I love it. I think that's a, a, a very good lead into one of the other areas we want to cover tonight, which is, where is the boundary between this is my hobby, it's free, it's fun, it's open, and Lord talk, for example, about the two businesses that you've had come out, the fact that, some that people, I know of. You, you know, and the fact that people, some some people, this is their, their job being in the space, Tony, explicitly. Uh, it, well, it, it's it, interesting because they have volunteers, just sorry, they have volunteers, what we say to them is you're going to build a business. So the people coming in to run the education groups, they're building a business that they're going to build into an education. They're just using our space as the mechanism to build it. Build your own community, show people how it works and build a business out of it. Uh, we've got um, Fire Tech Camp coming in, and they're running a six-week program through the summer, getting kids in. Um, so it's it, again, it's a business built within the business, totally enabled by getting access to machinery. It, I love it. Yeah. And we don't draw lines. And in fact, I think that's yeah. been a really important thing for us. I get asked a lot. By the way, if you set up a hack space or a make space, you'll have more people calling you to try to research you than you can be bothered. Yeah. I now tell them that I will charge my time if they want to research us. But I don't ask because a lot of people don't know that people doing the most interesting things cannot say if it's a hobby, if it might be a business, or if it isn't. Business. They don't know. They are doing something because it's challenging, or they have an idea, or they have a problem, or they've just met someone and they want to try doing something together. They don't know what it is, and we don't ask because asking would stop some of that creativity. I, I, really, I guess sorry. It's, it's limitations which we find incredible. Some people come in with an idea and it pushes the machines to the very edge. Mm -hmm. And then you actually get beyond the edge and we start hacking the machines to make things work. Mm -hmm. and that, that's where it gets really exciting. I have a quick question. I've actually had the chance to meet the tech shop CEO. Yeah. So he seems to have a slightly different model. Do you see any of that happening over here? Just he Saeed. Said, uh, yeah, I'm sorry? Saeed. No, uh, the one that I, ca I can't remember his name, the guy based in the valley. Yeah. Uh, so he, they wanted to actually start one here. And yeah. I just like in 2013 when I met him, and uh, he said he's going to start one here, and I've never seen anything here. So it's kind of curious. They're why still he, trying to do it. Oh, okay. okay. He's been trying for about three, four years. Okay. So I was just curious why hasn't that happened yet, and do you have any insights why it's happening? Because if you go there, I don't say I went there. It's brilliant. Yeah. It, it, it has, you know, compared to a hackerspace one, I know places. It's also even at the one in the valley. It's like it's awesome. But the thing is, like the if you want to use anything, uh, they charge you. Yeah. Do you think such a model will ever exist here? Yeah. Why does it that doesn't happen here? You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Step back a little bit into yeah. Said's background. Yeah. Um, so he was at 177 University. If anybody knows that as a place, it's where Google was founded, LinkedIn was founded, PayPal was founded. 
uh, and a number of other famous Valley-based companies went through them. And what he did very cleverly, his family owns the building, and they said, okay, we'll give you a tiny, tiny amount of rent and give us 1% of the company. So he earned stack loads of money, so he does exactly the same model through Tech Shop today, and that's exactly their model, which is come in here, we'll give you cheap guests, we'll take percentage of your company, happy day. So it's a funding model. They aren't interested at all in the people, the interest in the community, it's a straight financial plan. And it's brilliant, I love it. It's a, it's a very different model, yeah. but it works very well. Question? Yeah. Um, wondering about the link between makerspaces and manufacturing. Is there any really? Yes, definitely. Uh, Laura, you, you work for um, companies that make things. We find, I mean, there is an informal link, so we try to give pointers to our members to the companies that will help them scale up. So you make one off or two off, or you even make maybe 50 or 100 in the space, but then if you're scaling up, you need to go out. So we do have links with local manufacturing companies who will be able to find that next level scale. And we have links to local groups that help you with manufacturing advice, manufacturing advice service, so the call institute for manufacturing, that sort of thing. I mean, we're not really a suitable space for a scale manufacturer, and everyone understands that. Do you do kind of small batch production? Or? Well, we're a space where people can do whatever they want. So yes, yeah. people do do very small batch production, but sooner or later they find that there's too much contention for the machines or whatever, and they look to, you know, they want, they want extra specialisation. You know, our kit is prototyping kit, it's not manufacturing kit. If you happen to be doing something like Candy Box, which luckily is laser cut most of it, then you can sort of do it, and you'll go mad sooner or later. One thing to add to that briefly, which is, um, and it's broad in our side as well. Uh, so, we have a rule that uh, if you are running your business from the space, we ask you to try and find somewhere else because we just cannot deal with that number of people. Um, the number of people we get getting in touch saying, Oh, you've got really cheap desks, mm -hmm. so that's not the way it works. Um, you can, we, we kind of say that the space is sort of like a, it's a third space, it's not your house, it's not your office, it's somewhere in the middle. You go there to play, you don't go there to start your business, you don't go there to do these things. You go there and play, and if the business falls out the side or you change career or something, that's great, go and do that. We will support you all the way, we have the contacts for you to go to these places afterwards, but that's not where you do it. Um, it's not fair to take, to run your business and profit off it when other people are doing this for free, and then people are going there just to play. Yeah. So that's it, we, we, we have, I guess we're somewhat different in terms of... I would say actually it's very similar, so for instance, one of the businesses that's reduced its production time to prototype, you make space, it's staff member, one of them is one of our most active volunteers, so we get back from that. Um, but generally, we do also have a similar thing if someone is running a serious level of production and it's interfering with the communal use of the space, then we tell them to take it somewhere else. So, I was a member of Nature's for a year, so it was very interesting to me to see the dynamics of how things are run, but particularly, um, and that's my question. Um, to all, all of you, uh, what is your approach in, in, in regards to acquiring new equipment? Um, because there, there could be various kinds. Uh, do you buy, uh, buy based on what would attract the most amount of members? What would be the most useful for most amount of existing members? Do, um, do you buy it based on whoever is the loudest in championing the type of equipment that is going to be there? And when you decide to buy, do you buy the most expensive one, um, or the, the one that you can you can afford that is expensive that you, members wouldn't have access to otherwise, uh, or you buy something that is mid range or cheap uh, just to have that piece of equipment there? Um, I think all of those are valid. I'm just curious between all of you whether you have the same approach or what. what what's going to be? I'm, I'm going to take a sample because we ask everyone. Okay. <laughs> Tom, how do you go about deciding what to buy? Uh, well, some of it's donated stuff, some of it's like the bandsaw, we kind of put money together, which is kind of a tax basis approach. Um, we've kind of been, I've been given, given the title of Gift of the Gab, I suppose, <laughs> like trying to flag us maybe, I don't know, trying to like get uh, companies to give us stuff. It's not easy, um, but some of them have seen the benefit. We've got kind of Trotec, which you guys work with, and to make a um, Hitachi, we're going to kind of announce some news through Open Workshop Network next week about that. Um, um, and uh, so I can't remember them all. Uh, Bitfolk um, and uh, I can't remember them all, but sorry um, to those that I missed. But there's plenty of companies that are willing to help. It's not possible to find them all the time, but I think you know forming into these groups like UK uh, Hackspace Foundation and Open Workshop London 
will allow us to go to those companies and say, look, this is how many members we have, we have how many Facebook, or whatever it is that they're particularly interested in, and how many people we can reach and give those tools to, and try and use that as a way to try and get more things for us. The same way Fab Labs do. Yeah. Uh, John T, at the other end of the spectrum, and you're huge, I mean, how do you make a decision for 2,000 uh, people? We have done it and always have done it as a pledge system. So we don't get donated. We will get equipment donated by members sometimes. Uh, we've never had equipment from sponsors or anything. Uh, but we will ask that the members put in 50% of the cost of whatever it is. And any member can say, I want something random. Uh, and if enough people are willing to put enough money to go with it, then that's fine. Uh, but th this generally works really well because it means we, people are willing to put the money in, then you've got enough interest for it. Uh, so things like buying a new laser cutter, easily got the money in a couple of days. Me trying to buy an x-ray machine, still haven't found enough people to back that one. <laughs> so, you know, so, um, but, yeah, I would love an x-ray machine if you would get rid of one. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, that works really well for us. So, uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, another question? Oh yeah, that was just, no, it was just about the manufacturing connection. Because um, I read about uh, the China, um, is kind of trying to build 100 megaspaces in the year or something, which I'm like, trying to connect megaspaces to manufacturing. And there's a kind of, yeah, I guess there's a kind of dodgy connection where you get loads of kind of young people doing stuff and then people coming in and producing that stuff in big scale and, you know, yeah, the economy of that. And I just wanted to think more about that. What, what I'm saying, we finish with the previous thing which we were around because I actually want to hear what they had to say. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was just conscious of time running out. I know, so I was taking a couple of you as big, Tom as smaller. Yeah. Um, uh, if, if you um, Laura and Jeb, do you have anything particular to say about buying the kit? Most of our kit so far has been donations, I think, on the whole. Um, we're quite lucky in that we've got a few members who um, perhaps they've outgrown their garden shed. Um, so we take whatever big tools they've got, we stick a on loan from sticker on under the um, sort of acknowledgement that it might get damaged, but that's okay. So I think that's where most of our stuff has come from so far. Uh, we did win a 3D printer though, which was quite cool. Um, our first 3D printer we won. So. We take if there's we generally look for more than one person wanting it. So if it's a largest group, and we look for consensus to build about what it is exactly that's wanted. But we also look for people to pledge their time. It's not money things we do on money in the bank to buy stuff we want. We look for a core group of people of sufficient size to say to pledge that they will look after this kit, they will maintain it, they will train people, and so on. And if we hit that, then we will generally. And if there is consensus around what the model is that we should get, then generally we go ahead. But we kind of volunteer time is almost scarce resource, so we kind of try to buy us a little bit towards that. Um, and also, we do ask the people who want that piece of kit to take on the task of things like writing a risk assessment for it. And that fills the sheep from the goats pretty quickly. We do review this and stuff as well, and we offer help, but we make people put, their, put a bit of effort in. Great. Uh, okay, thank, thank you for putting that. Let's uh, turn to the question about China. 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 Yeah, China. Uh, Tony, I'm fascinated with China because. Um, America are leading the way on this. That you know, everyone says manufacturers going to China, manufacturers going to China. What most people have woken up is China is incredibly good at making components. So go buy the components, and it could be actually a board. So it could be a driver board. You buy the driver boards in, but you manufacture locally. And it's the difference of the machines. Once you've got machines on site, you don't have to send off your complete production run. You go and buy the things in. We do a lot of huge amount of local sourcing and local manufacture. This whole idea that you're going to just bring in a load of air and a box and packaging from another part of the world, kind of like it's an, it's an old model, it's a really old model which is being broken at every single level. America is leading the way and China is finding that, that trade relationship with China very, very frustrating. And they are building up local manufacturing massively. And the rest of Europe is starting to follow quite fast. Yeah, it's not me, just, you know, that's, that's what we're doing, it's a community. Oh, I love that? Yes. Yeah. Follow-up question. I have a follow-up question for you. One of the things that's been noticed in the startup scene is the, you know, hardware manufacturing, and uh, one of the things that seems to be is the intersection of hardware spaces kind of thing, and you know, hardware incubators coming up. Do you see that happening in the UK? Uh, hardware. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. manufacturing. It's kind of following up on what he just said because yeah, so the a, challenge is like we yeah. to I totally agree with John did what he's done, which is you're not allowed to build a commercial product through our lab. We allow you to do build one. But, so what we've got is we've got two floors above us with 120 desks, that's an incubator, go into there. You don't need to be in a hack space to, to make a product, you need to be in there for four hours, do an iteration, go back, do your design work, come back. You don't need to be in the lab to build. So it's, it's getting a different mentality. Desks, it's a waste of time. You want utilisation of machines to be near 100%. 
because that means you're building stuff. Okay. I want to, we're, we're nearing the end of the time, we're going to finish at 8 sharp. I'm going to give the panel a warning that two minutes before the end or so, I'm going to ask you for one sentence that you want people to take away from this meeting. So you've got a few minutes to talk about. One of the issues that we sort of just touched on here is what we might call the issue of discipline. How do you manage people going off the rails? Whether it's I'm taking over the, the, the maker space to print thousands from my business, or uh, occasionally you have disruptive members. I'm very interested in this is all part of how you maintain a community, and you may want to spread the question out a bit further. But how do you deal with, if you're going to be open to everyone, how do you deal with when you get someone who can potentially wreck the community in there? And how, how do you manage that? And I think I'm going to actually um, look to yeah, Laura, because she's... <laughs> so first of all, community management is a discipline. It's a profession now. So if you don't know how to do it, go get the book. Yeah. Hire someone who knows what they're doing. Um, I think this, we try to handle it by having a very lightweight framework, but we do have a framework. So we're sort of open to anyone. Anyone can come and try to be a member. But if we get someone who looks at induction like they're going to be extremely disruptive, we won't let them in. We've only actually had to do that once, but we have that there, and we will gate, and if we have problems, we'll deal with it. So we have a framework which lets us manage things, and which so far, touch wood, wherever wood is, um, it's working all right. That's a framework which means that we do a fairly heavy induction, which includes quite a lot of stuff about community. We have guidelines for what the community behavior should look like. They're very lightweight, but they're there, and we do try to enforce that so that the space is accessible for everybody, not just a core set of classic hackerspace people. And I think we probably diverge a little bit from some of the hackerspace design patterns in that. Um, but also, I would say we are, you know, we have a great diversity of memberships and quite a lot of hackerspaces do as well. Um, so yeah, a lightweight framework and a few people who are willing to enforce it and a culture of shared responsibility so far. But yeah, community management in that sense, do go check out. I can send some book references from it. To, but it's something which is better known now than it was. I'd like to pull Jem in for that. Gem, I'd like to pull you in because I'm very conscious as a member myself that So Make It is going through that transition where it's just getting yeah. a bit bigger. And the, the, the So Make It rule used to just be, hey, just be awesome. Uh, yeah. That was the rule. <laughs> and <laughs> now I actually had to put a few more sort of bit of shape around be awesome. Would you like to just talk about where, where So Make it's, It is going yeah, in transition? Yeah, we are in a very interesting place where we used to be a group of 10 to 20 friends. Um, and now we're moving to where... Uh, Actually, if I'm the key holder for the night, I might not recognise one person in the room, um, which has been a bit of a shock to the system. And yeah, we, we're going through this phase where we have to start thinking, actually, it's not a group of friends, it's a group of people with very dangerous equipment. Mm. And some of these people might be a bit big-headed and take up too much room, or they might spray paint the floor, or you know, it's something that might not matter to them, but to us, if they're not looking after the space correctly, we need to think about it. So, um, it's since we've moved into our new larger space in January, it's been something we've been looking at a lot more, and we are having problems with it. Um, we do have a set of rules, like I say, it used to be Be Awesome, which I think comes from Noisebridge in um, San Francisco, um, but we have had to sit down and look at our rules. We have a list of maybe 10. Maybe a bit more. The first rule is don't be on fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are now actually on a piece of paper in the maker space, which we haven't had to have before. Um, is that first rule based on a problem that you have? <laughs> it, it came well, from London. It's normally called rule zero. Yeah, it's rule zero. Yeah, sorry, so. my apologies. Um, yeah, so we've had to put these rules on a piece of paper in the actual space, which we've not had to do before. We have to make people be aware of a way to behave when they sign up as a member, which again, we've not really done too much of before, so yeah, it's something we're definitely exploring and having to think about. Liz, do you want to? Sure. In my experience of running um, our space, it's been the, the drafting of a key set of principles, sort of not many, and to be quite raw, but eight principles is um, really, really fundamentally important. And then during an induction, we have quite a lengthy induction process that is really only 50% about how to operate a belt sander safely. And 50% of it is hammering home the idea that if you're going to be a member here, it's a shared responsibility to 
work within and be a positive part of this shared ethos and of these principles. And really, beyond that, it's been self-policing. And we've scaled up over the year. The past year, we've doubled in membership size. And I think in that doubling, we've only had one instance where we felt someone wasn't self-regulating themselves properly. So it's about creating and agreeing to those principles. Yeah, we've, um, we've instigated two things, which is the experience of running Innovation Warehouse for eight years, uh, which is the coffee cup and the toilets. Okay, <laughs> number one, if you're seen putting a coffee cup down, you don't wash it up, any member goes up to them, taps on the shoulder, wash it up. If you're caught doing it, basically your license drops, you can't get on access to the machines. Second one's the toilets. Uh, if the toilet's dirty, don't come and tell me they're dirty, clean them. And if you're not prepared to be one of the members doing that, the reality is the rest of the stuff, Cleaning machines is, is the easy bit after you get those bits. And we've gone through the absolute basics. Coffee cups and toilets. If you're not prepared, don't bother joining. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I'd be interested to know what the induction process is mm. for the different spaces are. Yeah, because we can join it Friday. Particularly <laughs> okay, okay. Um, uh, because I've heard that someone quite lengthy, I'm going to, I'm going to ask um, uh, Liz and uh, probably John T, because you've, 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 you've been doing this a long time. When you've got a huge max space, what are the key things you try and achieve during your induction? Induction? So we are uh, a lot more radically open than most spaces. Um, to become a member of the hack space, uh, you can sign up online, you can register a card online if you're lucky, uh, and you can come to the space, and then you can start using the space without being inducted by anyone. You will get sent a list of rules and things, and that's about it. However, the heavier machinery, the things that you might damage or might damage you, uh, they get turned away by your, by your member card and you must be trained on those things. Um, we are actually probably going to be rolling out a very lightweight induction fairly soon, but that's actually worked remarkably well for us. Um, as long as you make sure that people understand where, that, what they that they should be telling other people not to be doing these things, it does become somewhat self-policing. I say somewhat quite loudly there. Um, so it, I, I would suggest you have an induction. Uh, and I would suggest more strongly that you, you have uh, a code of conduct to start with. Um, but it's great to have some rules about simple things, but a code of conduct that the trustees or directors or whatever they are can call people out on and get rid of them is very important. Not many spaces have had to ban people. I know I think in, in the UK, I think four have actually had to ban people. You've had to ban was well, yeah. Um, people generally aren't, aren't that bad. But the ones that need to be banned need to be banned. And, uh, they need to be banned from all of them. Sorry? We need a blacklist. That has been discussed. Yeah. A lot of people are very uncomfortable with that. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. uh, if some of these guys turn up in your space, you'll be blacklisted as well. Um, um, Laura, do, do you want to add anything to the comment about induction? Um, we, yeah, we, so induction is about 90 minutes. It is about 50% in fact about community. You might not get that impression. We insist on a credit card, we, we check a mailing address for you to check that you actually have a physical address, we take a photograph and we file it, um, and we also give the inductors the chance to change their mind, you know, they have a 24 hour kind of reflection period, so if they had anyone in the induction that they feel unable to tell them the night, sorry you're not coming in, they can still actually put a, you know, stop themselves when the person isn't in the room and think they don't want to let that person in. Um, yeah, and we, yeah, so it's, it's pretty intense, but on the other hand, touch wood, we've had very few community problems. How often do you do your inductions? Uh, as often as volunteers are able to, it's usually about one a week, probably on average it might be a bit more than one every 10 days or so. I probably should say that we do say that people should at least come on a tour. Yeah. So, you know, it's, but it's not, it's not forced thing, so people do slip through. And back. Okay, so I think there's lots more we could discuss. We're coming to the end of our time. Um, thank you all for listening. I will ask our panellists each one sentence they want people to take away start from here and I'm going to start because <laughs> I can feel the laser eyes hitting me. <laughs> Nigel, if we start this way and go the other way, I said Jen will be the have the last word. <laughs> Nigel, what would you like one sentence, what would you like people to take away? We are willing and keen to help. We don't want to kill off anything from within the maker spaces. So when we are offering to help, it has to be something that we want. It's no good us turning up on the doorstep and saying, we're here to help. I did that and that's part of my job. Um, the One sentence that you're out yeah. about yeah. seven. Yeah. Uh, lots of clauses. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> the not full stop. One last, can I just have one personal one, request? Yes. Electronics within the UK is all pervasive. It's got to be so all pervasive, it is actually invisible now. 
the UK has a great strength in electronics. There is no government policy for electronics. There is for aerospace, there is for automotive. Electronics is not considered as a, an area that needs tons and tons of help. One of the things that would help me is anything that you know of, which is fantastic, and exemplifies why UK electronics is fantastic. Those facts that you'll know from your members, please feed them through to me. It's things like, Okay, that's it. You've, you've had about 27 <laughs> sentences. Okay, everyone's going to have to have a very short sentence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tom, your short sentence you want people to go away with. I just wanted to say, I come from like an art and design background, and I know that like, this is not necessarily that forum, but like, these spaces do have a broader appeal than just technology, programming, hardware. It's obviously, that's all clear, but that's where some of the spaces really thrive, or are differentiating, and I think it's interesting to see how that across London and across the UK is allowing there to be 41 spaces or whatever it is in, in London. Okay, great. Thank you, Tom. That was, wasn't 27, but it was more than one sentence. Tony. <laughs> We're at Bank Station. It's four minutes from Moorgate. It's 90 seconds from Exit 9 at Bank Station and about three-minute walk from Mansion House. It's open all day Friday. Come and join in. Liz. Just want to highlight the importance of, I think, there's a huge importance for all of our spaces to better link up and communicate to, with one another because we can use, learn a huge amount from each other and about what we're experiencing and how we're doing things. John T. Starting a hackerspace is not as hard as we've made it seem, <laughs> and you should all do it. Uh, and also, if you'd like to give some, I know this is the full sentence now, um, <laughs> if you would like to uh, contribute to hackerspaces across the country, come talk to me or any of these people. Laura? Most of these spaces are run by volunteers. If you're going to ask something of those volunteers, think about what you're giving back to the community. Great. Great. Ah. Jeff, <laughs> last word. Uh, we're um, maker spaces, so we're a community of makers and we come together and make awesome things. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, to those who were thought they were going to speak as before they got here, and to the two who actually got roped in without warning, thank you very much. I hope you've all found this a very useful panel.